Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second episode of Unheard. Uh, and we have somebody very special today. Someone who has had, uh, in some ways, a very similar trajectory to mine, um, starting in the software world and then uh, entering education, or at least so his LinkedIn says. Uh, I, I want to welcome Priyank. Uh, his journey has been amazing. He has been involved in education from so many perspectives, so many um, ways in, in, in the last uh, several years. Um, and we are very, very lucky, very happy to have him over today for this very unique and very critical discussion that connects to very, very important dots. Uh, the dots, of course, one of them is education, uh, but the other one is culture. And uh, I don't think there's a better person to, uh, to discuss this with. Priyank, welcome uh, to Unheard. Thank you so much, Abhijit. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and, you know, discuss, uh, have a great conversation. Super. Um, Priyank, uh, before we start connecting education with culture, um, I, I want to set the context. What, what do we mean? What is culture? What is the idea uh, that drives um, drives culture? What what do we want to, um, you know, what is the what is the box we could put this in, in some ways? I think that's a very good beginning. See, you know, we tend to, there are times, uh, if we go by bookish definition, we can say that these are customary beliefs, the way we live our daily life, the norms, the societal norms that we have. But a lot of times we tend to box it and feel that culture is something animist and static in time. And I think that is where the problems begins with. Like, you know, it is it is something which evolves and evolves over time and i think we have to understand that there's there's no static nature to it now what happens we we somewhere feel that culture is something so when we say indian culture there are some dots we want to put in okay this is indian this is not indian though it is the same indians who are following something but it is hard to put say say that something in today may be indian tomorrow may not be you know so we have to understand that cultures evolve over time. But one thing which is very critical and probably we'll discuss more in the podcast is who is the agent of that change? Who decides? Who says that why the culture transformation happening? What What is your culture? What is not your culture? I think that is something which is critical for us to understand and discuss more. Brilliant. Yes, the ever-changing nature of culture. I mean, this is, uh, this is the most, uh, uh, I mean, politically hot topic around the world, isn't it? Uh, the The um, are we sticking? Are we adhering? Are we trying to protect and save and trying to just make sure that it, it remains the same way it has been for hundreds of years? Or are we contributing to its positive um, positive change over time? Um, but in, in a more simple way, are we able to accept that culture will keep changing? And this yeah. is uh, uh, this has been quite a tool to, to be able to understand um, uh, an identity of a people or the fear insecurities that we we connect with uh, with this identity um right. in in our last podcast in our last um, episode we were discussing um, and i'm very happy that we'll go a lot deeper into it this time we were discussing about the genesis of schools um in the sort of colonial industrial period and um and i think what we could not discuss then was this um was this viewpoint um of culture because when india received the education system and, and then of course several countries in in asia africa and uh, in south america um received their education systems um that we use today from um from western uh, colonists and that has a very significant connection with culture also is what i understand that there is a a certain perspective so if we had to go back down that lane and and try to imagine or try to uh, to point out um, how uh, culture was perceived, how let's say Indian culture was perceived by by the British um, or by 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 the same people who were creating schools. Then, um, yeah, what would you? How do you see that? Yeah, I think see first of all any context. So we when we say culture, we have to bring context in. So we have to see them how they work together. So any context is brought together or divided, disintegrated based on the culture which is prevalent. So now when the Britishers came in and we had this, you know, the whole modern education system we and we prefer to, in academy, we also prefer to say Western education. 
see a lot of people tend to believe that this was only because they wanted to create indians who were you know who couldn't think who couldn't be critical thinkers as such and just work as clerks which is partly right what we also have to understand was for a country like india and if they really wanted to rule for a long time what they wanted to do was disintegrate integrate indians from their own culture and how could that happen was when you bring in an education system and indoctrinate the ideas that your own culture is inferior what you believe in what you think of is something which is inferior and you have to adopt something which is more rational and something which is more progressive which ideally could be christianity or anything else so the idea was that you start stop believing in your own culture and your own belief systems and stop thinking and consider something else as the as something which is you know you know the great cultural thing as such now they were actually not able to achieve it to be honest that is how when the britishers came in with this education system you see a lot of rote learning happened though indian traditions we had oral traditions of learning but it was not exactly rote learning by us now what happened here is since people could not understand english the the scientific or mathematical concepts or under, they could not build through the languages which they were trying to propagate english was the backbone we started doing a lot, lot of rote learning and instead of disintegrating people from their cultures what happened was these they started using english as a tool to get the jobs and that's it though over a period of time what has happened even when british has left slowly and steadily it seeped in our cultures you know we started considering our own culture our own belief systems our own understanding as inferior without even exploring what it really means and we have been able to cling the whole cultural bracket into something in some, some dots but still that is what the whole frame of our culture became that we are some inferior because of these pointers otherwise we couldn't even see what is what is lying in the western education or the western culture which is not so conducive as a community we were together as a community we were coming we we, we belong to a certain place and that is very important and, you know the kind of mental health gap it has has been created the issues which have come in and then we see that you know we though we argued it we knew, need more psychologists we need more you know psychotherapist counselors and everybody but we also have to understand traditionally how our communities have been broken in fact there's a very good paper on this and if you have maybe i'll take a couple of minutes more on that so if you look at some of the best education systems if you look at i i wrote a paper uh, on this how edu- how education impact suicides so if you look at some of the best education system like finland or in india also if you look at states like kerala with highest literacy rates and and you take oecd reports and world bank reports and find out the best countries with uh, tertiary attainments and best education levels you'll see that their suicide levels are also high so the question mm-hmm. big it's there's a very interesting paper on kerala in fact how why exactly when the education when the literacy levels are so high education attainment levels are so high why is People, why are people committing suicide and so the paper kind of discusses how there has been systematic destruction of communities disintegration of families and you know slowly and steadily and that is why kerala as a culture you know kind of is 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 kind of in a transition where it is not able to root itself in its context and that is very important for you to for you as a as an individual and also as a community wow this is um yeah i think one of the most interesting things that i also realized when i first went to finland was was exactly the same thing that uh, also also by the way the happiest country in the world isn't it uh, or sometimes second but <laughs> but that's a whole different discussion uh, about what how happiness is measured in this case uh, and yet it is yeah um, this sort of human isolation um, that education seems to bring um i think it starts very early isn't it in in trying to make people believe that okay your growth and your development and your progress is entirely just you as an individual that if you, if you have yeah. house if you succeed um, as an okay uh, i was saying that uh, this idea of individual is pretty early in uh, education um, right that we we see that we start considering success if 
I alone am successful. I have money. I have cars. In fact, maybe I'm a little bit more successful if people around me are not successful because then I can, I can, um, I can show up. You know, I can, uh, I can look better than others. And and yeah. um, yeah. in that process, completely isolating ourselves. Yeah, and um, also, I'll just add here that we have to look at it also in terms of what is the relationship of humans or individuals with the context how that changes if i am in a certain you know in for instance there is a very famous tedx talk uh, given by wade davis i'm giving references somebody wants to go and watch it will be good but here really there he discusses... i'm again losing you go ahead yeah so I'm saying so Go in ahead. that talk sure. he was talking about a certain community uh, where the geographical location is such that drought is a very common phenomenon. It's a way of life. You deal with it. You learn to deal with it. It's not something which is catastrophic as such. It is something which is part of their lives. But eventually when these students, these kids, they go to the modern schools as such, their drought is essentially as a catastrophic phenomenon. And you have to, you know, it is something which is dreadful and you, you know, and it's very hard to deal with it and things like that. It's not something which is cultural for them to deal with in their own ways. So what was core to them, what was core to their daily living suddenly became a problem their own knowledge bank of how to live with the drought suddenly didn't exist in the modern uh, schooling system as such. And now what they essentially did was you go and then you can't go back to your context because your relationship with the context is broken. That I think is very core. In fact, forget about, you know, in India also, there's a, there's an interesting paper by Padma Sarangpani. She's a professor at this. She talks about there's a community in India where Every child, by default, by their own uh, community understanding, they know about plants. And every plant, they understand how this plant can be used and if this has a medicinal value or what it is. So, But when these kids go to school, suddenly this knowledge is of no use. Suddenly, this the school says that you have to study what we want you to do. We want you to be scientists and probably study about plants when you make you forget yeah. about plant first and then you become an ethnobotanist or you know, botanist and go to a college and study degree, which you probably already know so much about. So that is why I think we have to understand how education builds the relationship with the context. And that is something which is very necessary. You have to build that relationship with the context. And if education is not able to do it and disintegrate you from your context, I think it doesn't serve the purpose. I quite find the, this terminology I see used very many, many times. Uh, even by sometimes educators themselves, uh, they call themselves first generation learners. And uh, I've, I've always found it very fascinating that, um, yeah. I, that we are even, uh, we have this belief that we are the first of our lineage to be learning. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is quite sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the mere fact that you are assuming that everything that the child has or traditionally they have believed in or everything is not knowledge as such, or they were not learning at all, at all. I think we are, at, you know, we then create a mass, which is served, yeah. which is, you know, we, which understand things only in a certain way. And then we can, we push them in a competition, which we, where they can only scratch surface, nothing else. Yeah. So coming back to this sort of historical context, um, I mean, at least the certainly the British tried. I mean, they were not able to destroy um, India's connection with culture. In some other places, I am I see that there is yeah a lot more success that sometimes colonists had um, in no, in other yeah. countries. Um, but why try? Um, my my question you know, is why destroy the culture you know why why does it make sense for somebody who's trying to colonize and take over a people to destroy their culture why is this a tool otherwise how would you rule when you rule a country you know when you want them to think uh, along with you the way you want them to how do you do that you know see the idea is that essentially if you want to rule people you don't want to tell them that we are your rulers you know you want to tell them that we are your saviors 
and we tell you that this is a superior thing yeah. we are giving you and more rational more scientific and those buzzwords which are there and to tell you that we are going to help you in all of that so i think that was the reason why essentially britishers told us that see if you what you are you are probably bunch of illiterates uneducated people who don't understand anything and your whole as famously macaulay said that the whole you know it's the whole cultural uh, heritage of india is not even equal to the one shelf of knowledge at, though there's a good history to this there was huge amount of learning knowledge heritage with us but not everything was on paper it was mostly oral transmission happening that and then a lot of scholars starting putting our knowledge into papers and claiming at their as their own and that has happened historically in indian context and you know it is like yeah. the same same uh, english scholar or philosopher will give us the theorem which we probably you know have discussed sometime before and not really written it in a in stone saying that it is our own but i think those are discussions different i will come back to your question that if you really want to be in a space and you know make sure the people live based on the way you want them to be then you become your savior their savior and not exactly tell them that we are ruling over you no absolutely i mean um i guess it's easier to rule a people that want to be ruled that do not feel that they have the capacity to rule themselves um yeah. or they have the um you know the, the wherewithal um it is yeah it, it, it's it's clever <laughs> i <laughs> i think uh i think we have to uh, and even when i look at schools and and when i look at the the system of education um one thing after i guess a few years of working in education i realized was um it might be evil but it is extremely clever um and i guess until you give it that um it is very hard to um to dissect it without first acknowledging that uh, it is quite cleverly done you know um and i yeah this is um, uh, certainly a certainly something that all of us i guess um, whether it is um, people who are involved in education or not but um being able to decolonize ourselves being able to uh, come out of this um uh, because at this point i think we are the ones who are propagating it promoting it and continuing it <laughs> so uh, the 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 colonists are gone and and we have only filled up uh, some of the seats um but tell me this that um uh, from a sort of a political philosophy of ruling people how did this enter education and i'm sure it has entered several other systems um from from economies and and markets um to research and science <laughs> you know uh, how did it end up in education i'll tell you you know after independence um education was not really as such our focus i'm talking about primary education so we focused very much on economics so our idea was that that okay the economy is in shambles and we have to do something about it that is why if you look at all the first commissions and so we have secondary education commission uh, university grants commission then we have iit act this is 1949 51 62 all of that was about higher education or secondary education we never focused on primary education look at look at how interesting this is see we want to have the best of the education systems but our primary goal was ec- economy so we only focused on higher education though in 1950 we had the constitution it was written that we should have universalization of primary education but that's it nothing happened after that 1966 we spoke a little about it but nothing happened it was only 1993 and which is very interesting because somebody asked me what were we doing for 47 years after independence we never focused on primary education as such we only focused on primary education 1993 because we had a conference in 1990 where in dakar senegal where we uh, it was established see the primary education has an indirect impact on economy and now we have to we should essentially focus so we had the grants from world bank we had the grants from imf and everywhere and that is where the first policy came about primary education which is called the dpep where we focused on primary education so 
so we first of all we need to understand how education is deeply linked with economy and capitalism we have been able to you know and that is why precisely the system as such is kind of running because how it is linked with it and even today a lot of educators tend to still feel that see education is about economic development but i think we we go we go completely wrong there you know if we tend to see education as a primarily as a tool for economic development and human development just becomes a by product if there was a way where human development was not required and we could have directly economic development then that would have happened this is actually a mask in terms of that humans are and again develop what is development we will have a different discussion on what exactly is development then you know because it is hard to say that we are developing as such because if economic development is a parameter for development then do we really want that kind of development so coming back we actually never focused on primary we never focused on kids so are to say that we wanted an education system and we wanted to you know even though we may stand against what it really meant it but even then it was not really about kids it was still about economy understand what were we doing that time and why was primary education not giving children small kids not the best of the education which we believe in probably somebody may believe something else that is fine but still not giving them the kind of education they want is a question that what is really education about you know why is state in- interested in it invested in it not really for probably what we all believe it to be because we tend to associate education a lot of time with with any kind of social evil even if it is about you know any problem any corruption unemployment or you when you talk about any kind of social problem you always say that education is in is the solution for it panacea for it but what you are actually doing it why state is investing it is completely probably different from what it is intended out of it so the idea of development i mean this has um, been the biggest um, well almost an infecting idea right the yeah. idea what is development and and for the longest time i guess um, that has been that has been singularly about in, eco- economies and uh, the same people define the idea of development that define uh, for for many many governments and countries uh, that they should invest in public schooling uh, and they should invest the, the way they should invest in it so i'm glad you mentioned world bank uh, and then people like um, imf and uh, and se- then several others they are the same people who have built this idea of um, of development being uh, very much economy focused and they're the same people who are pushing governments to invest in 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 schooling and so much that i think um this push to india was so um, intense that uh, we never got a chance to think about what kind of education we want we just knew that we had to keep multiplying the schools so keep increasing you know the hundreds and thousands and 10000s and uh, ultimately reaching like a, a million and a half um this yeah, certainly is a problematic um perspective but if it is not economy if we don't see education's final outcome as building a workforce or building an economy then what should be what should be its uh, goal i think one thing we have to focus on is what is the ecological footprint of whatever kind of even systems or education systems or or development that we have so i'll give an example now let's say we have this is taken from a book called i'm taking from a book called wayfinder so he, this guy he he gives an example that see let's say mm, there's a boy in the hills and um, boy or a girl but right now i'm just talking about boy just trying to be <laughs> give the example which he gave so there's a boy in the hills and he worships the hills and says that you know you know it's something which is very specific to me because the climate and everything is kind of determined so now because he worships and because he feels that they, he is very close to nature he is, takes care of it now when the same boy goes to schools and learns that okay these are superstitions there's nothing called as you know god and nature and uh, this specific relationship and everything and these are just piles of rock and we can mine it so essentially what you did was you say that yes superstition has been broken and this is education because superstition has been broken but what how the relationship of the boy changed with the context and what happened due to it the boy is ready to mine it the boy is ready. that is why the you see filth across mountains so much of filth across so 
see phil having phil across mountains is probably giving more uh, you know exchange of currency to people who come th- then said that okay they should not be filled and then clean it so it kind of revolves and then said yes economy is improving economy is improving. because whenever there is an exchange of money we have economy there yeah. you know so it is essentially you destroy it then create ways to you know uh, better it and then you say that the, we have we have the best of the systems or the clean we have new technology which is cleaning and everything but we don't seem to ask that why is the same boy who was worshiping and taking care of the pond is now you know kind of destroying it so i think we need to understand that when we say certain thing is a superstition and certain thing is what relationship is again i probably in this whole podcast we'll go back to relationship with the context see it, this is also interesting that when you talk about educate pick up any education leader they will always talk about contextual education but <laughs> for them what does contextual education mean use local amenities local cultures local beliefs local whatever local props you have to make sure that they learn their concepts yeah it can, it may not need anything for the context but you learn something else so for having an understanding use the local culture not for the local culture itself local context itself so as a child who has gone to school maybe learn till 12th grade is is that same boy is only destroying the hills and nothing else not taking care of the, the they they were so what happened to that relationship so i think the key term which people you know tend to look for terms is he, ecological footprint yeah no certainly i um i think earlier on in the episode we discussed a lot about how colonialism and that political thought destroyed cultures but then capitalism has been almost equally responsible in fact it's in yeah, in some ways that is very it's hard it. to separate yeah. um separate them out and uh, i call it the washington apples uh, problem right <laughs> ultimately for the sake of making profit you destroy all the other varieties of apples uh, and you make profit you're... out of the same thing also like you destroy yeah, and, and make the... profit out of yeah. cleaning it out up of... so every... <laughs> yeah this um uh, another term i hear in in conferences is this sort of a child centered education and um, you know it's what they it took me some time i mean it it took me some time and after that i found it very difficult to attend conferences again that <laughs> doesn't mean that the, the child who's deciding they just mean that we will all gather around the child and center all of our thoughts on him you know on that kid uh, and and make the decisions for them and this this sort of um, Uh, call it patriarchy call it uh, like this pathologically um, you know condescending behavior um, it, you know it is uh, simply continuous um, but there is i mean there, there must be some effort that that, that uh, i i see that the, the we have this problem we have um, now uh, a continuing education system and several living systems that we follow um that is aimed towards economic development and cultural destruction um and not destruction from the sense that we could say oh it is um uh, evolution or natural evolution of the culture but but very much this sort of homogenization very much um uh, this idea of not being able to think for ourselves um so but are there people is there a is there a is there a genuine um you know um against the tide movement that uh, is being made um in india at least you know see honestly the thing is whoever is working in education is probably thinking they are against the tide only you know <laughs> people tend to feel that uh, what they are doing is is something which is against the system and you know it is something which is going to revamp everything and better it so it's and that is why a lot of times when i go to conferences and particularly industry conferences so you know there is a difference between industry conference and academic conferences so probably some but particularly in industry conferences we see a lot of people so much passionate i i admire the passion with which they want to change and revamp and do things so much passion they have to change things and everything but and they believe in what they're doing and they and they they have so much of interest in what they're doing so i really am so i think i i always feel that okay see first problem is solved that people are genuinely interested passionate they don't want to know what it is about but at least you know there are some genuine people who are 
but then there is a lack of you know grounding as such you know what does it really mean for change i was speaking to a very senior leader of an organization development sector she is working with one southern indian government and they are revamping revamping the schools there so she asked me very interesting question she asked me say we give free and compulsory education to children till 8th grade fine and we make sure that the best of education is delivered all right and we are working with the state so that uh, you know whatever obstacles they have we train the teachers and we make sure the best of textbooks and everything come in but what i see is that when we educate them till 8th grade and then we leave them on their own and nothing happens you know getting education till 8th grade not, means nothing for them they ideally will go back and will start thinking what should i do now and 9th grade they have to pay you know it's not free anymore so if they have to pay then they they can't access school payment was always an issue so some people are always held it is fine but most of them are you know left in tatters they are in the middle of nowhere so she was asking me what should we do in that case you know and individual and so i was like what exactly are you doing then you know you know why are you creating a system which is making children more helpless as such and then what a uh, many of these organization do is some of these kids do really well and they picture them and show that see these children were able to do it so everybody can do it and th- this is the biggest lie which is floating where yeah, people tend to see that some people are able to do it so everybody can do it i think we can't be more wrong wrong about it you know so i think when you when you ask that are there genuine efforts yes genuinity is there you know people are putting genuine efforts but the problem is we really don't know what really effort look like and we probably think that our business was to make sure that eighth grade education is done and that is it but what it really meant for the child what it meant for the context there is no social mobility happening there is no economic mobility happening there is no any such the only thing that is happening is a forced movement and i say this again and again but there is a forced movement happening that what you essentially telling the child if you give them the best of education that please move out of the context go somewhere else find places for higher education your 12th grade and college and so you are telling them that only thing that can happen now is for you to move and this coerced movement can benefit nobody not because movement is a problem yes you should move you should travel the world you should look at everything but not coerced movement it's a movement by choice not coerced so when you have a coerced movement where let's assume that we give good education to all the children let's say we have you know millions of children who are coming out we give them 2 crore children are coming out of tail gate so let's say we give them good education they are essentially asked to move to the cities for a better education system for a better college for a better university where there are limited opportunities so it doesn't say when 15 lakh children 1.5 million children give the exam of je and only we know we have only hardly 50000 seats and what happens this design is such that 14 50 have to fail there's no other way around it and when the design is such that and you give the best of education and say i am again i'm not going why that is a good education or not but even if they assume that it's a good education you are essentially pushing them to move and then why for something which is anyway limited and then it doesn't mean anything for them and then they end up in slums of certain urban cities and then they buy the food which they were probably their parents were growing and then it is added to the economy so economy is growing yeah i mean this has pretty much been the reason for several tribal cultures to to completely yeah. be uh, um you know moving into uh, first into missionary schools or or uh, you know uh, and then moving into higher education getting further and further disconnected it's not even the physical movement i believe it's the, the sort of mental uh, disconnection like once that happens even if you're standing in in the middle of the forest your family lived in um you can't feel anything for it you just have no no relationship with it Yes. um i i see this problem um, also with alternate education or, or many alternate education ideas that um that solve that that create a good learning space but then ultimately people have to go fit into the system again yeah. and and this sort alternative of... education schools or spaces end up till 8th grade that's it you want to experiment and do everything till 8th grade and then you tell them okay now you are on your own this this cross feeding of systems um is a i mean i think uh, it comes down to thinking about creating all the adjunct systems that is needed to sustain an alternative it is no longer enough that okay you've given 
three, four years of alternate learning, uh, you have to think about, okay, how does this person uh, find a job? How does this person start a business? How, because all of these systems, uh, how does this person, you know, get married? Even these systems are all uh, connected to how, to the education system of the way it exists in, in, in that format. And we don't have alternates for those systems. And, um, but I feel the, the most genuine ones are the ones who are saying, I don't know what's the answer. I'm trying something, you know, that's, uh, that have, those have been the most beautiful uh, projects or, or um, people I've met um, who I have felt that this to me is the hopeful bit that there are, there is a growing number of people wanting to dive in without necessarily feeling that they need to know all the answers from the very beginning. Because if we, because that has what has stopped the academic world from fixing itself. The, right. This idea that, okay, we have to know. We, if we don't know the answers, we can't try it out. So we need some radical experimentation for sure. And also, I'll just add, even after more than 75 years of independence, we still don't have a school with children from every background coming. It's it's pathetic. If you can't have a school or a learning space where children from different backgrounds can come in and learn with each other, I think you cannot have a society which is any kind of empathetic towards each other. I think, uh, you know, in this book called, um, I'm forgetting the name, Krishnumar had a book uh, where, yeah. he writes that, where he writes that diversity of human condition is core to learning. You know, you should experience the diversity of human condition. And we are having schools after schools who are divided on pay levels. And we don't have a schooling system or state system or any kind of system. Forget about good or bad, but any kind of system where we have diversity as such. And how much ever diversity we have, we want to stop it at the gate. That mm -hmm. okay, your your culture, your attire, your belief, everything will stop. We will stop it right there. We want to create one common. And now we are on policy level. We are arguing for one nation, one curriculum. Right? The most most yeah. bizarre thing yeah. ever. Yeah, on one culture. hand, we are trying to say how context is important, how context and another is like one nation only. So I think, I don't <laughs> know where we are heading. So it's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. It is. Um, I mean, it is depressingly funny, but it is, uh, yeah, it is both at the same time. Um, but no, I, I, I do, I do. It, it always uh, tickles me a little bit that um I mean, we have this word Vishwa Vidyalaya, which is a very old word. Um, you know, uh, it, it stands for a university, but it really means a global global learning space. And Nalanda and Takshila and these universities were like that. They had such a global participation. Now, none of us grow up with anybody except from people who are like within this tiny bubble of yeah. our economic you know, capacity. Uh, and certainly not from, from, I mean, unless you are in a very costly Canadian school, you're not going to grow up with people from another country. Um, and and it, it why it tickles me is because today, Nalanda, when it is refurbished, I have to say, it is, um, it never had classrooms. In, in, historically, Nalanda had only workshops and, and open spaces and, and libraries. It did not have the idea of classrooms uh, as such. And, but today it does. And today yeah. it Again, caters. It is no longer a wish for It is, uh, it is uh, dead in, in that aspect. Um, so pluralism, a country like India, not being able to seek out pluralism um, in its systems. Let, let's touch that also. Very interesting topic you brought up. See, it's very interesting. So this guy, father of uh, multicultural education, his name is James Max. So he he is considered the father of this concept, and he has written many papers on it. You read these papers. There are five elements of a multicultural education according to him. And he has been widely accepted across the globe. And one of them, like I'll just mention a few of them. It is like content should be there, included from different parts, uh, different people, different backgrounds. Then we should have equity pedagogy. We should have uh, empowering school culture, knowledge construction, so uh, and prejudice reduction. These are the five aspects. Nowhere this guy is saying, so we should ideally have content from different people. We should ideally make sure that there should be reduction of prejudice should be happening, that we consider certain. So in India, right, we say Biharis are like this and UP people are like this and all prejudices float. So that should happen. But we want that to happen through textbooks, not through having people from different cultures. 
nowhere yeah. he mentioned that we should actually have a classroom from different cultures so that people can interact with each other and get rid of this prejudice again we want to teach them we want to teach them and say that okay prejudice should be removed how how just by teaching me how that can how does that can happen so it's it's very interesting or you know i have not read everything of him but whatever right it's very interesting that he doesn't even talk about how you know diversity should come in and if there are spaces like there's a space in hyderabad uh ali grow i have done a lot of work there where they have people from different backgrounds coming in and probably the only place which i have seen you know which have such diversity but we don't know about it there's hardly anyone talking to them asking them how did you do it what are you doing how what challenges are you fa- facing i think it's a very core aspect of any education system to have diversity in the classroom and if somebody in india itself is able to do it please go and ask them talk to them nobody is call, calling him to a tedx talk nobody is talking to him and telling them then what is happening what does it really mean to have a diverse classroom no no limelight nothing they don't want it i'm just saying that even if somebody yeah. is happening in our own country we probably go back and look at the western world <laughs> you look at you look at all the big uh, even i look at some of the reports from the some of the biggest organization in india full of foreign authors all foreign references and everything and i keep saying it either you don't know that indian stuff exist you have not skin the scholarly work indians do or you just don't understand how important it is to have indian context you know you and this this one advice i give to everybody please first read indian authors they have done phenomenal work in indian space just don't keep quote, quoting quoting i'm not saying that it's not worth it but come on indian context yeah. i mean shining shining the torch where it should be shined yeah it's yeah. um and being able to 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 move that focus around um priyank i mean this has been such a spirited discussion even with our uh, glitching uh, internet connection and uh, a myriad of problems in recording this but um, i think i am i'm superbly inspired thank you so much and uh, we will hear of course a lot from you thank you everybody who listened and we will uh, we will be again uh, coming out i am sure i i just didn't i just didn't realize that we are, our time is up so there is so much to talk so there is so much to discuss and i don't know how many things i you know we would have probably gone on to discuss but yes thank you so much for having me it was a great uh, discussion yeah. i'm sure yeah thank you so much